Hello and welcome to Bookkeepers Bootcamp. This is session one, day one. We did have a little intro party just over an hour and a half ago just to explain to newbies what goes on in Bookkeepers Bootcamp. But everyone that's here, you are very, very welcome. Thank you for joining us. Today is, as I say, session one of Bootcamp 2024. And we are joined with the fabulous Rebecca Williams. I'm going to let Rebecca introduce herself <laughs> Second. I'm just going to do a little bit of admin before we get started. So if you're watching today, welcome. The comments are open. This is very much an interactive course, interactive um, event. Sorry. So if you go to streamyard.com forward slash Facebook, you will be able to see that you can um, enable us to see you. Um, if you see, you're going to streamyard.com forward slash Facebook. And if you want to, you don't have to, but if you let StreamYard see your Facebook Live comments, when we're live and when you're asking us questions, we will be able to see who you are. So first things first, I can, oh, I can see Hannah and I can see Rebecca. Um, yes, if you want to say hi, if you let us know you're here live, you can put in the comments, hashtag live. And if you're watching this on the replay, the replays will stay in the Six Figure Bookkeepers Club until the 31st of March. You can put hashtag replay. And also, we want you to get those light bulbs ready. Bootcamp is all about learning new things, having those light bulb moments, and all for free. We're doing this all for free. Um, we're all about collaboration over competition in this community, and we want everyone to be the best version of themselves. That's why we do this for free. So if you find that light bulb emoji, pop it in the comments below, because I want it to be the first emoji that you've got at your fingertips or your thumb tips, so that you can. That's definitely a millennial thing, isn't it? Rather than <laughs> busy. Um, yeah, they're all at the ready. Amazing, amazing. So let me introduce you to the wonderful, wonderful Rebecca Williams. Rebecca is one of our ambassadors um, because she is constantly giving back to this community and going above and beyond. And um, we absolutely love her. She runs a monthly AML session in our success lounge for our success lounge members, which is an accountability session where she always starts off training them and teach them something. And then they get tabbed time to do the work so that they're always up to date with AML. And I know as a practice owner, have been for many, many years, obviously I have sold mine now, but AML for me, when it came in about 2007, 2008, I remember reading about it and thinking, what does this mean for me? What does this mean for my practice and my clients? It felt very big. It felt very scary. It felt like I was just nervous all the time. And we hear from our community all the time that people feel scared around AML. They assume that they're doing it wrong. They assume they don't really understand everything about it. It's a completely new territory. And so we felt it was really important in this boot camp to raise this and get the best of the best. I love the, um, what did Zoe call you? An AML goddess. Yeah, <laughs> that was quite the compliment. Um, here to take us back right to the beginning, to the foundation stages. Um, this is like episode one, like if you don't know anything about AML, you're in the right place. Maybe you're training, maybe you're thinking about being a bookkeeper, maybe you've heard something about what is this? Um, and I'm gonna let Re Rebecca introduce herself and then she is gonna, take over for this session yeah so for those that don't know me <clears throat> obviously i'm rebecca um can everybody hear me okay as well i've got the mic over here this time um so i run accounting made easy um which i've had for about three years now before that i worked in practice and then i worked in industry for a number of years so um i've got lots of grays at this point <laughs> Um, so I've been in the industry for a while, but I've been lucky because I've been able to see AML from um, a practice point of view in a top 10 firm and also um, seeing processes and controls being implemented in other firms. Um, also on the industry side, I've been able to see it from another perspective. So um, not so much from the, the compliance side, but also the real world that we live in side, shall we say, <laughs> and how to really go about that. So what one of the things that I really want to address in these sessions is I almost want you to forget that you know anything about AML and we're going to do this and we're going to just pretend it's day one from the AML point of view and we're going to relearn how we're thinking about AML, how we're approaching AML, 
and really what it takes to put in, I'd say, best practice. So I'm going to give you lots of examples and walk you through all of this. It's going to be really interactive as well. So we're going to make it fun, as fun as AML can be. And hopefully by the end of it, you're going to feel a lot better about AML. So how we're going to fit all this in though, Joe? <laughs> oh, we're going to do our best. Well, and that's why we're bringing you in every day this week. Um, Rebecca is going to be hosting our 11 a.m. sessions Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday this week because Rebecca could talk forever about AML because she is such a font of knowledge. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I love how we're going to try and make this exciting. It's not an exciting thing, but it's very important. And actually, I know that when I got this sorted in my practice, and when I had confidence around this, it impacted everything because it helped me to sell. It helped me to increase my prices. It helped me with confidence across the board. So, um, uh, yeah, I'd love to. I mean, I know you're going to do some like um, you're going to do some interactive things, aren't you? So that people mm -hmm. we get to know how people are feeling. So I can't wait. Yeah. So I think one of the fundamentals about AML is like everything, if you think you know, there's a there's a concept about the wolf behind the door um, that I've, I've talked about a couple of times before. So if you don't open the door, your perspective of that wolf behind the door is that it's this massive thing and it's, you know, it's going to tackle you the moment that you open the door sort of thing. Um, big beast mode. However, a lot of the times the reality of the things that we're overthinking in our head are a lot smaller. And when you open the door, there's actually a cute little puppy on the other side. Um, so we're going to think like that when we're approaching AML this week and um, we're going to turn the conversation round from this aspect of being a really tick box exercise, it's really compliant, heavy, oh my god, am I doing everything right, to how can we turn AML into an opportunity and let's look at it a completely different way where we're integrating it every day and it's not something we're just going to touch once a year and never see it again. How are we going to do that? So I do have an interactive session that I want everybody to join. But before we do get started, everybody needs to make sure that you've got a pen and paper with you. So take just a minute and go check if you've got pen and paper with you. Or if you're on a desktop, then obviously you've got Word or something, just somewhere that you can write something down, um, essentially. So I'm going to get this up in a second. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to join, essentially, a poll. So Bear with me one second whilst I just get this up. Yeah, everyone, you're going to want to take notes. It's going to be full of golden nuggets and light bulbs. Um, and yeah, this is new technology we're trying this today. I use technology quite a lot when I'm at the Zero Partners Advisory Council because we will be sitting around a table and then we have loads of people coming in from all over the world on like Google Meet. And so we often do these polls and I was like, oh, I'd love to do this in a boot camp. And Rebecca, you've brought it today. So amazing. So fingers crossed it all works. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to share my screen a second. Um, yeah. So bear with me a moment. There we go. So it's just come up there. So this is Mentimeter. Now, on this next slide, there's going to be um, a code for you to join. So it's going to give you some instructions. So if we just turn to this tab here, if you all go on your phone or on your laptop, on your computer, go to www.menti.com and then type in the code 33602648. And we're going to start off with our first question. I'm just going to give you all just a second to do that. So the beauty of Menti um, or Mentimeter yeah, <laughs> is that we can see these results live. Um, and it's, again, it's very interactive. You can use that QR code um, that you can see on the screen too um, if you can't quite find how to join. So I'm just going to ask you to answer this first question, which is how do you essentially feel about AML at the moment? Oh, we've got a few people going up and down. <laughs> going up and down. I love this. I love this. So mm -hmm. people were going to menti.com and using that code 33602648. Thank you. Oh, people putting in the comments. Well done. That's amazing. I can see more and more people joining. So we've got 87 people live on the call. And at the moment, we've got 
27 people in here. Wow, well, oh, it's growing. Yeah, it's tw 29, 31 at the moment. So I'm just going to leave that going just for a second. And what I'll say about all these sessions again is it's really, really important throughout boot camp to make sure that you're being really, really honest, um, brutally honest almost. So I, I know this morning we're all talking about our first uh, sessions. I think mine was, I want to say it was, oh God, it could have been either June 21 or December 21, something around those times. And I was actually quite surprised because I come from a background or did where we didn't really, there wasn't that community feel and nobody really, you know, put themselves out there. And then the comments in the group on the bootcamp were just everybody was just going full force and sharing wins, losses, everything, how they felt. And that's what we need to do in bootcamp. So be brutally honest, say exactly how you feel about AML. And it could be that you hate it. It could be that you love it, <laughs> but you think you get most of it. Um, so we're on 45 votes there. So I'd say most have some questions um, and that's OK. And I think I completely understand why you will have questions. Um, now, when it comes to AML, something that a lot of people um, kind of overlook, I guess, because it's not really talked about in the study textbooks that you see um, and it's not talked about in the professional bodies either. Now, we have 22 different professional bodies that are AML supervised. 20? Really? 22? I had no idea. Yeah. So naturally, every single um, professional body that has that AML supervision is going to do things a little bit differently. Um, so one might say that you've got a portal that you've got to fill in. Another might say you've got to take this offline. Another might say, OK, well, it's OK to go ahead and view copy passport, copy um, driving license. Another might say, no, you need to keep a hard copy on file. So every single professional body has a tiny tweak that's ever so slightly different. So sometimes when you ask a question and you can ask questions throughout these sessions, you might get a different answer. So one person might have one view and another might have a different view. And you'll have seen that if you saw me and David speaking on um, the FAB Any Answers Live this, this week, just gone. Um, so we did disagree on some things, but that's just the nature of depending on what professional body you're in, et cetera. Um, so let's just move on to this next slide a second. So on the app now, you should be able to type in a word on how you currently feel around AML. So these are all just going to pop up. So, do, you know, is it, do you feel happy about AML? You know, when you feel panicky, yeah, overwhelmed. Oh, good words. Yep. Keep it going. By the way, this chair is really squeaky. So if you keep hearing that, <laughs> Uncertain, yeah, absolutely nervous, worried, scary, anxious, yeah. scared, sure. or, yeah, absolutely, oh, really good. Beginner, eye opening. Oh, I'm loving this, just ticking boxes, mm -hmm. yeah. And this, this is not surprising because I think a lot again of the professional bodies don't do a great job of giving you that you know evidence, giving you case studies to say this is what you should be doing. Um, and the reason for that is because a lot of the time what they what they are trying to give you, but maybe not in the best way, is a sense of having a risk based approach in your firm. So mm -hmm. they can't give you all of the answers because every single practice is different. Every practice is different clientele. They've got they're working in different industries. You've got different experiences to the next person. Your practice is very, very different. So in some circumstances, they can't give you a one size fits all answer and approach to AML. Mm -hmm. So hopefully I'm going to break some of this down for you. Um, and yeah, it's not straightforward. So, you know, how, how many people in the group, I'd love to know in the comments, set up a bookkeeping practice because you wanted to work around the children and you wanted to have flexibility. And it was a you know great career choice, um, very minimal startup costs, very attractive. Um, and you can work for yourself, obviously, and have that flexibility. I can guarantee that not even 1% of you would have said it's because I want to go ahead and comply with this big red book of AML compliance. And true, so true. You, it, it's funny though, because I know um, in all of um, the studies, textbooks, so ICB, AAT, I've, I've looked at all of them at this point. Um, 
they're very good at telling you about ethics and they're very good at implementing that into every single exam now, which never used to be the case. But they don't go into AML in great amounts of detail and neither do they give you case studies again that you can look at and learn from. This is what Ashley said. If our regulatory bodies gave us case studies, it would go a long way to understanding it. And I completely, completely agree. Yeah. And also, actually, um, one of the governing bodies of the CCAB who provide a lot of guidance around AML, um, they, even though they're, they're catered to the bookkeeping and accountancy industry, they don't actually give a lot of case studies specific to our industry. So it's quite difficult to say you need to do X, Y, and Z, but not give you examples that you can follow, look at, and learn from. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to this next one here. So what I want to do is essentially change those feelings and thoughts that you've got around AML. And I'm not, these sessions, I'm not going to go into, um, you know, really technical guidance. I'm not going to blow your mind. You're not going to walk away from this feeling really scared and anxious and thinking, oh, I've got all these things to do. It's going to be a different mindset because you're going to see the opportunities around AML. So just got a picture of a brain here. I like this picture. <laughs> um, because again, I think I'm just going to ask a question. It's not, there's not a poll on this in here, but um, how many people, apart from those that had worked in a practice environment before, and actually, no, let's scrap that, even those that worked in a practice, were told how to set up an accountancy firm and bookkeeping firm? Were you told the steps, what you needed to do exactly? No. No? No? And, you know, what you need to do in order to, you can, you have an understanding on how you need to obtain clients and where you need to go. Nothing. No, no. So you understand double entry and you understand how to record certain items and deal with it from a bookkeeping point of view. But at no point was there any guidance around, okay, so you set up this firm now. Now what do we need to do from an AML point of view? Mm -hmm. Nothing. Nothing. Better. So... There's, it's not surprising to me then when when you, when you start seeing this guidance and you start seeing from all the regulators that oh such a body's been fined such amount and you know you're not doing what you need to do it's this sort of scary attitude towards it, isn't it and it, I don't know about you but the more scared I get about something the more I freeze up mm -hmm. and I get over very head in the sand like an yeah. ostrich yeah and I don't want to deal with it anymore um mm -hmm. so I'm going to give you a different way of looking at this um I'm going to make this fun for you and yeah and I understand that's why it would put you off and this is a reason why a lot of the the individuals that that do face having a fine is because they kind of have an idea what to do but maybe they've not written down what they have done or maybe they just shy away from it a little bit because it just seems this big overwhelming task that we need to do but I can guarantee you it, it's not that bad so before we start with that I just want to ask you what emotion would you like to feel about AML? So by the end of this, what do you want to feel around AML? Do you want to smile when you think about AML? Um, confident? Yep. Do you want to think, you know, when you're going to bed at night? I don't know about you, but I probably reanalyze everything that I've ever said in the last 24 hours. And then I overanalyze it. And then I look at all the things that I should have done. And oh, my God, I need to do X, Y, Z. Ah, I don't want to be thinking about AML when I go to bed. <laughs> Yeah, stress-free, calm. And the funny thing is, when when you start to feel these things, your 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 energy, your physical energy increases, and so you feel more energy to go and do other things. And you know, you're not tired all the time, and you feel like you can go for that walk and look after yourself in other ways. If you feel more comfortable, calm, relaxed about something, and you just get that headspace of knowing that you've done what you should have done or what you needed to do. Um, and you've not given yourself something else to worry about. So we don't need to feel those ways when we're running a firm. So let's make it so that you feel supported and stress-free for all of this. So let's just move on. So this big, scary thing, AML, there's actually only five key areas to AML, um, which is surprising when you look at all the guidance. I think there's 200 and something pages of the CCAB or something daft. Um, there's also... Um, the FTA and all sorts of other um, regulations and guidance. But essentially, when we really boil it down, AML is five areas. It's know your client, so your client due diligence forms. 
it's your AML policies and procedures. So how you've approached AML, what you're going to do, what does your firm look like? What staff training has happened? Do they know what to do in certain situations? Has it been recorded? Firm-wide risk assessment, and then the MLRO. And that is it. Hmm. Now, it's not so scary, is it? Well, no, if you can break anything down, it feels less scary, doesn't it? And yeah, I've, no, I've never seen it just put like that, just like they're the five areas, because I think sometimes they're spoken about in the context of big documents, and then therefore it just feels like overwhelming because of words like assessment, procedure, policy, forms. I think it's the language. Um, so, okay, you can't yeah. <laughs> how's that? How's that sound um, in the comments section? Does five, if we have five areas to focus on, it's not this big task, this big scary task that we need to focus on. It's just five areas that we need to get down and do well. Easy, anybody can do that. Yeah, more manageable. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I'm just going to move on. So oh, KYC, about. it's yeah. just know your client. That's it. And we all know our clients. Bookkeepers are actually 10 times better. And I'm going to say this because I am an accountant. I'm a chartered accountant, so I can say this. Bookkeepers know their clients a lot better than accountants do. And there's a reason for it. And it's because you get to see more of your client than most accountants do. You know, not my firm, but most accountants see their clients once a year. You mm. see your clients, you know, every week, every month, you're asking them questions, you're seeing the books, you're in the day to day of what's going on. So you have a really good understanding already of knowing your client. Mm. And you can probably tell, you know, if something happens in the bank that day that you're reconciling, you can probably tell them it's an increase in sales before you look at a report. You think, okay, that's new. Why has that happened? And you'll be asking those questions without knowing that you're actually in comp being compliant with AML. So, yeah, bookkeepers are already one step ahead of the game. So let's just move on. So, again, just changing this mindset on how we look at AML um, in the session. I want you to just think about what makes your business unique. So, why is your your business different to every other business and every single person that is watching this right now you're different to somebody else your practice is different to everybody else and yes you're providing bookkeeping but you'll be doing it a different way you'll be using a different system you'll be approaching it completely different maybe you do you know your practice is within a certain set number of hours maybe you ask your question your questions to your client a different way your communication is different You've got a different CRM system, etc. So what makes your business unique to you? It could be your experience. So I just want you to write that on the app. It could be really anything. Your clientele, the industry that they work in. Maybe you only work with, you know, big businesses. Maybe you work with sole traders. Yeah, your team. Yeah, enthusiasm. You, yourself. So I, I find it really funny sometimes, um, just going off topic slightly, when we all get overwhelmed and we all get a little bit of imposter syndrome. I definitely do. Um, but that word imposter syndrome, it, it kind of makes me laugh now a little bit because I do get anxious like everybody else does. But when you really narrow things down, every single person is just so unique and different to everybody. And it's the same with our practices. You're completely different um, to every other practice out there. And you'll have unique qualities about you that make you you. Mm. Yeah, expertise. 46 years of experience, Lisa. I think you need an award. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. So I, this does highlight how um, that question really rattles some people. Um, mm. Because it... It is. It plays to us thinking, well, who do we think we are to think we're special? Yeah. Or who do we think we are to think we're unique? Um, we were covering this in the earlier session because at 1 p.m. Zoe and I will be sharing our brand new premiere of our documentary, which I laugh at because I think it's absolutely hilarious that we've got a mini documentary. Um, and I'm and he's feeling the same. What makes me? Why do I think I can have that? So I, I don't think it ever changes. And I think wherever you are, um, but you care and you 
you know, what makes you different? Like think of someone else that you've seen. Maybe you've had a client come to you and they were treated in a way that was outside your values. Your values make you different and unique. Um, but I, I find it interesting what it conjures up for us when we're asked what makes us feel unique. Yeah, we, but what but we I, feel, don't we? I think what, what's really interesting to me, what I've noticed over the years is I always lacked confidence always um that was just something that I grew up with I was the quiet one you know I mumbled to ask to leave the table I would hate my name being called in a registering class I would just dread it my heart and be like bump it but and because my surname's Williams I'd be the last person to have to sit through all day. um and that was just the way that I was um but it always makes me you know not laugh but it intrigues me that so many bookkeepers have such a lack of confidence because mm. you know you are providing what can only be described in most circumstances as a stellar service to these clients. You're there every day. You've got that human aspect. You know, you really care about your clients, which again, some of the professionals who are not bookkeepers might not care as much, um, might not go into the nth detail like you do. You've got patience, resilience, and also attention to detail, which again is a key skill. Um, but yeah, it always just makes me take a step back and think wow really you're doing such yeah. a great job and <laughs> we can't see it for ourselves can we no it's so interesting so interesting yeah. thank you for sharing everyone everything's 100 percent anonymous as well so yeah well done though i know it's not easy now the reason why i'm bringing this up is because when we talk about something called um our aml policies and procedures and we talk about you know, writing down basically a document that says what we're going to do about AML. And, you know, we talk about, OK, well, we've created a firm wide risk assessment to identify risks. We look at clients, we onboard them, et cetera, et cetera. In that AML policies and controls document, and it's a big fancy word for just saying this is what we do here. So if somebody was to come in tomorrow, a new staff member or, you know, God forbid you get, you know, AML inspected, but you could pass that along and say, this is what we do here. And yeah. what strikes me and something that a lot of um, firms fall down on bookkeepers and accountants is that we don't personalize these documents. So we don't say, you know, hi, we're accounting made easy. We're a hundred percent remote. Um, these are the clients that we tend to service our we do service everybody from different industries and this is the size and this is the software that we use and you know we use Zama for our AML, et cetera. We don't actually make that document bespoke. But when you look at all of these answers here, this is what makes us unique. And yet we're not writing it on our AML policies and procedures. And a lot of firms have been fined because they'll download the AML um, policies and procedures template from the professional body. And won't even add their own name to it and just right. tick box it and go along mm -hmm. <laughs> and be like, oh, I'm done now. Um, so we don't want to be doing that. Okay. Yeah. So within that, within some of the professional bodies like the ICB and IEB, you've got a portal online um, where you're filling in documentation and it's got to be online. Um, you can do a little bit of AML outside of that, but you have to make sure that you update the portal but it doesn't mean that you can't have an external report around aml policies and procedures that is personal to you so i would just be mindful of that when you are preparing um that document that you can put it's okay i'm going to give you the the confidence and the okay to say you can put a bit of personality into these um processes so yeah, just a bit of a guidance around that um, with the uniqueness guide. So this could be anything. So it could be your background. It could be the clients that you service. It could be what systems you're using. What's your app stack look like? Have, have you documented that? That is a massive task, by the way. <laughs> I've tried to sit down numerous times and actually do the flow chart of, well, we use this for this and we use this. But the great thing about that is you'll do that for AML now to work out what makes you unique. But when you're on board in a client and you are talking them through how you work, you could put that into a PDF presentation like we have to say, oh, by the way, we use zero for this and we use this for this. And this is how it works together. This is how it flows together. And clients love that. Mm -hmm. So 
again, you can use this as an opportunity to get a bit more control over your practice and see what you're using, maybe start looking at pricing. Are you paying the right price for that? Is there an alternative that might work better for you, et cetera? So it's always a good opportunity. Um, have you spoken about your background in, the, in your document to say, you know, I've got three years experience, I've got five years experience, this, and this is the type of client I used to work with, and this is who we work with now. What professional body are you part of? Have you written that down? So just food for thought. Now let's move on to the next one. So as you might have guessed from this, what we're really focusing on um, in this session is essentially risk, but not in the way that you think, um, I would say. So um, what always strikes me as interesting is when, when I worked in practice, and this is the reason why I moved into industry, one of the many reasons, um, I had worked by that point in forensics, I had led audits, I was a client manager, I had done bookkeeping from the job in the bag, I, you know, pretty much done everything at that point, it felt like. Um, and never in that time had I produced a risk assessment. And it was only when I worked in industry that I produced my first risk assessment. Um, so what I mean by that, just to put this into perspective, right, as a bookkeeper now, have you ever sat back and just thought to yourself, okay, so I'm running this firm, I'm run, running this practice and I'm servicing these clients and I'm talking to my clients about, you know, I'm looking at um, things like their um, competitors, etc. I'm looking at their industry that they work in and I'm looking at the news that's happening, you know, all of this budget that's just come out with um, the changes in national insurance. Um, you know, if those rates were to go up, that would be a risk. Now, have you ever at any point looked at your at your business and thought, what risks do I face as a business owner? And we spend so much time with our clients doing that sort of thing with them, but we never look internally and go, well, what is it that I could face? Mm -hmm. um, Joe, you'll have done this at some point. Um, yeah. Now, I'm just going to ask this into, into the into the group. Have you ever ever considered the risk that face you as a bookkeeper running a firm and and that can be internal and external yeah internal so and external so things like you know um if a key member of staff was to leave tomorrow what's mm. your gut feeling like oh my god <laughs> um it could be you know what if a piece of legislation changes tomorrow that means that we're no longer able to work with a certain sector. Or maybe, for instance, if we're with HMRC and that's our body for AML, our AML supervision, and all of a sudden HMRC gets that taken off them tomorrow, how would that impact us? Have we thought about things like that? I think if anyone was running their practice um, in COVID, that was mm -hmm. a, a real, like all my clients lost their income when would that ever happen um all my clients were shut um because i was working with salon owners so it did make me change a little bit of light and offer mm -hmm. my services elsewhere because you know um not that i, I didn't really off, i didn't market to anywhere else but i just accepted others but yeah it's um this is really interesting and and definitely i think the thing i i thought a lot about most of the time is when my team grew and when members of staff said they were leaving or something like that that felt like a big risk i think yeah, that's a that, natural one a lot of the time you only think about the risk when it's happened exactly yes and it's like is it um i want to say a surname, a surname is dibble susan dibble the yes. legal lady yes. and i watched her her webinar um on friday and i was like oh my god <laughs> <laughs> panic um because there's so many things that you don't consider until it's happened and small businesses are so so uh, for many reasons you know cash flow reasons all sorts of things you don't think about putting in essentially insurance until something happens because you might not be aware of it or because of things like cash flow um management etc and also the reason why i'm asking this question by the way and um, we'll come to light in a minute um I don't think, again, that the professional bodies, whether that be, I keep calling them out, but, you know, AAT, ICB, ATT, ACCA and the ICW, SEMA, SIPFA, 
all of them, I don't think they do a very good job at giving you the skills to recognise risks associated with your firm. I don't. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I'm going to run through some of those with you in, in, in just a second. But the reason, again, why this is important to consider is because when you're preparing a firm-wide risk assessment, you're only looking at the risks associated from an AML point of view and what could go wrong. And if it does go wrong, what do we do? And also, what, how can we stop those things? How, how, what risk mitigation, that's what we call it, um, can we put into place to either identify red flags, red flags, risks, etc., cetera, um, and essentially stop something from happening um, later down the line? Um, so I don't think we look at it from this point of view either, but it could be an opportunity again, just to take a step back and say, let's look at everything, you know? But let's look at the risk we're facing, maybe look at insurance, et cetera, and other elements. It would have a, like some kind of framework for that, wouldn't it? Mm. So let's just move to this next slide here. So this, again, is why I bring this up, because a lot of um, those in practice actually, again, are fined later down the road because they actually don't have a firm-wide risk assessment at all. So they've not said, look, we're a business, we've identified there are risks, we've run in a business, and this is what we're going to do about it. Mm -hmm. Now, that in its its simplest form, that's really easy to understand. But when someone says, okay, you need to do a firm-wide risk assessment, it's like, what the heck does that even mean? Like, yeah. what, what am I looking at? Yeah. So we're going to focus on those in a second, so don't worry. I'm going to break it down. So let's just move on a second. So again, just like there's only five key areas of AML, there's actually only five key, I'd say maybe six key areas of the firm-wide risk assessment, technically, if you really want to go down that route, but there's really only five. Um, so the first one of those is clients. So when we're looking at that, that document, the firm-wide risk assessment, so on your pen and paper now that you've got in front of you, um, I want you to start writing down you know, look at your clients and think about who are you working with? So are you working with sole traders? Are you working with limited companies? Are they all in the beauty industry? Are they all CIS subcontractors? Do you have a mix of clients? Are they cash intensive? You know, what, what does that look like? Just really simply, just a few bullet points. You know, and when we say structure, we mean sole trader, limited company, LLP, partnership. So in that firm-wide risk assessment, that's what the bodies are asking you to do, is just to identify those clients, firstly. So I'm just going to give you just a second. Just reading a couple of those comments. Um, so there, what, again, the, the firm, the, the, I keep calling it firm-wide risk assessment, but... Um, Basically, what they're asking you to do in really simple terms is to say outright, just, just a quick summary to say, OK, based on the clients that I have right now, would I identify those clients as being low risk because there's not a lot going on? You know, they're very simple. They're people that I know. Um, you know, I've met them. I deal with them all the time. The transactions are quite simple, etc. So would I categorize those overall as being low risk or are most of my clients medium risk or are they high risk? So again, just have a little think. This is so interesting. I love it that you're breaking it down because actually when you look at it in this way, you can come up with a couple of sentences on each thing. And this is ultimately what creates your firm wide risk assessment. But exactly. it feels like they don't ask you the questions in this way. It's like, what's the risk with your clients? <laughs> it's like, oh, individually, what are you talking about? This is how, so this is this is really, really good. And someone's asked, what is the difference between, oh, sorry, um, it moved, difference between medium and high risk? So, is there a, is there a threshold to measure and identify whether they're low, medium or high. Okay, so this is again where, you know, when when you look at all of the guidance and they keep just saying, you know, risk-based approach, risk-based approach, and you're like, what on earth are you talking about? Mm -hmm. 
what they're saying is basically, you know, Joe could look at a client and she could say, based on these facts, I'm going to say that this client is low risk because again, they're really straightforward. They're just a sole trader. They, you know, maybe they're um, a plumber and they work in the UK, they work locally. Um, they've got supporting documentation behind everything, X, Y, and Z, fine. Joe might turn around and say on her risk assessment, I think this person is low risk. Mm -hmm. From our firm, we th we would deem this type of person who've got simplified due diligence, all the rest of it, because of these things, again, noting them down, actually writing them down to say why you think that person is low risk. I might say, I don't consider any client low risk. So difference in opinion. And the reason why I might say that is because I might say something like, I don't deem there being any risk mitigation factors, anything that I could possibly put in place to 100% say that this person has never, will never be involved in money laundering, anti-terrorist, all the rest of it. So I might just take a blanket approach in my firm and say, I don't consider anybody low risk. Mm -hmm. I consider everybody either medium or high. And so, that's your, your opinion. And that's your opinion. But but it's your uh, calculated opinion. You've got reason behind it. Exactly. So the whole point of this risk-based approach is you're okay to say, well, I, I think that's, this person's going to be low risk and overall our clients are low risk because we've got, you know, 90% of our clients we've deemed as low. As long as you can justify it and say, yeah. we're happy with this. We've got, you know, our staff are trained to identify, you know, high transactions or um, where something might be a little bit wrong or they're trained to um, look at photo ID and proof of address and to review that that's up to date, et cetera, that they understand um, the industry that that individual works in. And again, if, if I was to take on a client tomorrow um, that worked in the pharmaceutical industry, immediately, two things. A, I would classify them as high risk because I don't know that industry <laughs> well enough. So I don't know the red flags. I don't know how to deal with this person. I, I don't understand the industry well enough. So immediately they would be high risk for me. And I might then turn around and say, well, because I don't know them ethically, it would not be right for me to take this client on. So my firm-wide risk assessment and my policies, I might say, if I were to identify somebody that is high risk, I might take the decision that I don't wish to work with this person, mm. but it's writing it down. Mm. So there's no, what I'd say to the answer of, is there a threshold? There's no threshold per se, but there are some identification areas that you can look at for instance like as I say you know um somebody who has ties to a high risk country would obviously be higher risk yeah. um somebody who has a complex structure is going to be higher risk um you know a group structure is going to be a lot more complicated than a sole trader and they could pass money between the companies etc there's all sorts of things people can do um, but there's, there's high risk. So you'd associate those with being high risk. Um, so okay, can I ask a question here? Yeah. I think it's really, um, Victoria's asked, how do you complete it if you don't have any clients yet? So you're brand new practice, you've got your practice license, you want to get your firm wide risk assessment started. How would you do that? So what I would have is, again, I would have these key areas that we're going to have a look at in a second. Um, so clients is number one. So we've got five areas. Um, you can't put anything in there just yet because you don't have clients. So what I would say is there is another document, as I say, the AML policies and, and procedures document is different to the firm-wide risk assessment. The policies is to say, this is what we would do. Um, this is how we would do it. This is the staff training that we would provide. This is the MLRO. We get staff to sign a document to say- just explain what an MLRO is, sorry. Yeah. Um, the money laundering reporting officer. So if you're a sole trader, if it's just you and your business, you are automatically the MLRO. But if you've got a big firm, you've got multiple staff, you can pick somebody other than yourself as the director or owner to be the money laundering reporting officer. 
And how it works is that if anybody in a firm has suspicions or queries around money laundering um, and terrorist financing, they can go to this MLRO and ask questions. And it's all confidential, all internal. So you might want to have a template that, that somebody could send, you know, a templated email if you want to contact the MLRO or just an internal document um, to do that. But what you've got to do is to write down in this policies and procedures document, this is how I'm going to do this. This is how I'm going to approach AML. We mm -hmm. have a risk-based approach. We look at clients on an individual basis, one by one. We don't take a blanket approach. Um, maybe you use Verify or you use Zama or some kind of software to verify that the photo ID is you know, saying who they, they, they are. Write that down. If that's what you do, write it down. And that's that's the key here. This is where a lot a lot of firms fall down. Rebecca, so, we're getting into we're at forty six minutes. Yeah, so we're just going to move on. Second, um, so let's move on to the next section of this. So geography. Mm -hmm. So you know when you're thinking about your ideal client and where they are, you need to be saying again in your firm wide risk assessment, our clients are UK only. Are they abroad? Do they have ties abroad, etc. Where are they? Um, write it down and then also write down what the risk could be if they are for instance abroad if they're in a high risk country so are all your clients to you from a geography point of view low risk or are they medium or are they high and why mm -hmm. so that's a really easy one and any yeah. risk could be a risk mitigation could be we meet all of our clients face to face. We go out to their premises so we know that they are a legitimate business or we view them online on Zoom and we, we ask them to hold up the passport. We check that that's correct. Or even though we don't meet them face to face, we do use another system like Verify, like Zama to check that they are who they say they are. Because from our point of view, it's like that whole conversation around a £10 note. If you were to get a £10 note tomorrow, would you be able to say that that is definitely a legitimate 10 pound note and it's the same with a passport or driving license have you had the training to say that's a definite passport or driving license or would mm. it be better to use a software that can go through those checks and know what they're looking for to say that's a legitimate passport etc um but if you're doing that that's a risk mitigation point and you want to put it in the risk assessment so just move on quickly and um, what um, Nick asked, what are the classes high risk countries? I think each each supervisory body has their list or is it just one blanket list? One blanket risk. So um, if you look on, um, if you just type in UK AML um, high risk countries, there is a, a UK listing because when we used to be part of um, Europe um, before Brexit, they had one list that we all adhere to. Now the UK has its own, but it's basically a mirror. So <laughs> just have a look on that. Um, some of the governing, the professional bodies even, I've noticed don't always update that list. So mm -hmm. I just go straight to the source. And if you're yeah. not sure, go to the CCAB. They've got the list in there. Um, we can also, after this, put some, you know, a few free resources that you can go to to help um, on that front. So next area, so we're on number three, is products. So what services do you actually offer at the moment? Do you offer payroll? Do you offer trust and company formation? Um, do you offer a client bank account? Do you offer bookkeeping? So again, this is going to be different for every single bookkeeping practice. So what do you offer? And if you're offering that service, the question you want to be asking yourself is, do you know the risks associated with that, that service? So payroll is high risk. Trust and company formation, high risk. Client accounts, high risk. Bookkeeping, not so much. Um, and the reason for those is because essentially with payroll, so many things can go wrong from, you know, money laundering, drugs, um, prostitution, all sorts of nasty, nasty things um, associated with payroll that people can get away with. So you've got to be really careful when offering payroll services. Um, but again, with that in mind, you can put in your risk assessment. Well, I'm aware we have training on the on this aspect and we're aware these things can happen. 
but these are the things we're putting into place and checks and controls that we're doing so um to make sure that you know we're identifying any red flags etc um company formation so people might come to you and ask you to form a company um in order to launder money through that company so you've got to be on the tcsp register if you can offer those services but again there'll be questions that you're asking your clients to identify if this is a legitimate business and all the rest of it so that again is the risk mitigation client accounts if you offer a bank account that clients can use mega high risk <laughs> i'm going to say mega because again clients could use that um to add funds into there that are illegitimate all the rest of it um very very high risk area most bookkeepers will not be offering a client account i don't offer a client account um and i would almost say steer away from that um but yeah as long as you can stay in there what services you offer and that you're aware that there are certain risks associated. And if you don't know what they are and you don't know where to start, if you just go to your professional body, they have a list of examples, which mm -hmm. will help. So if you just do a quick Google search or ask here. Transaction, there's only one. So if you offer a client bank account, then there are risks associated with that and you need to be labeling that as being a high risk area. Um, and what steps are you going to take to make sure that your clients aren't using that to money launder, etc. Simple. Next one. Delivery. So again, are you meeting your clients face to face? Is it online? Are you conducting video chats, etc.? Um, and on a scale of low, medium, high risk, what would you consider that to be? So maybe Somebody who's meeting their clients face to face might have a lower risk than somebody who never meets their clients face to face. Um, and if that is the case and you're like us, 100 percent remote, we do go and see our clients. We do actually go visit their premises. Um, but for those where, you know, initially we might not have seen them face to face, we would conduct a video chat and that would be a risk mitigation. So video chat ask them in real time to hold up the passport to see who they are etc have multiple chats are these individuals happy to have a chat or are they avoiding putting the webcam off etc these are the things you want to be writing down um so those i think those are our five areas amazing and this fancy term here so this is something that came up not so long ago um yeah i'm just reading some of the comments as we're going through um so proliferation financing so here um again this is just basically where um somebody is using your firm to money launder so they're using you as the bookkeeper or an accountant to make their firm their their company look legitimate they're using a bookkeeper or an accountant um so again the way that you can be aware of somebody um coming to you doing these nasty things is that you you know conduct street uh, screen tests you have staff training to recognize red flags you monitor clients on a regular basis and there'll be other things that you're doing too but again you want to be writing it down that's the key so if you've ever heard me talk about aml you'll hear me talk about what used to be the atp but i keep calling it tap now because it's easier to remember so just to tap um and that's thoughts, action, process. So what have you thought about? What have you actually done? And have you written it down somewhere that that's what you've done? So simple. And the last thing, <laughs> just what's really interesting is a lot of firms will go through this entire process and then won't write down a summary risk at the end. Right. So based on all of these factors here, where do we place ourselves? So for those five areas, did we have a lot of low risk, a lot of medium or a lot of high? And are we happy with that? Or do we need to put in more controls, et cetera? Mm. Um, yeah. And, and again, it's something we need to be doing. So we need to have a summary on our, our overall risk assessment, because that's the whole point of the risk assessment in the first place, to have a summary view of our risk as a firm. Mm. So, yeah, that's interesting. So some don't make sure you do this so again it's, it's almost like a scorecard so you've gone through the five questions and now we can see where are we are 
and have we written it down at the bottom? It doesn't have to be, you know, an essay. It can be a paragraph. We've noticed this is where we are. We'd like to be over here. Maybe we could add more controls in. What do we need to do? What does that look like? Um, but write it down. <laughs> so I'll just I mean, move on to it quick because we've got like four minutes, haven't we? Um, four minutes. I want to let you all know before uh, we carry on that um, if you have enjoyed today's session, which lots of you have because you're here and you're glued and you're staying on, and I'm going to make us too smaller for a second, and I'm just going to share that we do have um, Rebecca will be, if you can see up here, she's going to be running yeah free masterclass just for people here so um if you go to bit.ly forward slash aml masterclass um it's a masterclass she's gonna be running on tuesday i've written it down tuesday the 26th of march at 8 p.m on zoom you put in the code six figure aml you will get this masterclass for free now obviously come back Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, where well, she's going to be breaking this. I mean, you can see how there is so much to this. This is why we're doing four sessions, then plus the masterclass um, to help you out with that. So, um, yeah, I'm going to leave that up on screen um, yeah. and then go to any, like, we've got a couple of minutes for some questions. Yeah, any questions, just fire away there. We'll stay on there for just a second. Um, and then I'm going to give you some homework to do because the whole point of these sessions is that you you take something away that you can action. Um, and these these um, takeaways are only going to be something you can do for 10 minutes, you know, between 10 minutes and half an hour um, every single day to help you with AML. So, yeah, they're all in, in the comment section. So um, just because of time, just going to skip through here. But bear in mind, we've got Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday to ask questions. Yeah. And please, I encourage you to do so. Maybe even in the group, Joe. if we put mm. the hashtag AML yeah. or hashtag AML questions, we oh. can go through. Now, you'll see this properly on your um, on your app or your phone, however you, you've gone into um, Menti. But there is um, an example here. Um, and what I want you to do is either on a piece of paper or a Word document, on the left-hand side, I want you to write down the things that, again, this is just a 10-minute task, Areas that you think you're exceeding with, with um, your firm-wide risk assessment. So things that you've actually done and actioned and written down. And then on the right is an opportunity. So do we have an opportunity to make this better? Can we put more bespoke information into our policies and controls? Because again, we can actually make these things tailored to our own firm. Um, yeah. And I highly advise you to do that. Yeah. Um, do we need to add that, you know, the, we're actually doing all these other things over here to help with, um, to mitigate the risk, to lower the risk down. Um, but have we written them down that we're actually doing this? Or are we using a new software provider that we haven't written down on our policies that we need to do? So any opportunity on the right hand side, but things we're doing really well on the left hand side. And I want you to at least write one thing that you're doing really well. And it could be that you're just attending this session yeah great amazing oh one thing just one thing and rebecca thank you so much I, this has been amazing i wish i still had my fun <laughs> so that i could <laughs> implement, implement this because this has definitely been a bugbear one of those things that has worried me scared me um made me feel that this was harder um to do because there was no not that clarity so thank you so much. So if you want to register for the Tuesday, the 26th masterclass at 8 p.m., please um, use that bit.ly forward slash AML masterclass with the code six figure AML. If you want to write that down now. Um, and we will be back with Rebecca every day. Well, Monday, today, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We've got four sessions with Rebecca, and I'm sure you're all going to really want to implement imagine after today how much further you're going to be with aml um and that's what we want we want transformation and we know this is for free but we want transformation um so thank you rebecca for day one you have blown our minds as per usual the aml goddess uh, will be back tomorrow please join us at 1 p.m when me and zoe are going to be sharing the premiere of our documentary which 
I'm really excited uh, to be sharing with you all. And then we'll be back again this evening at 8 p.m. So all sessions for boot camp are 11, 1 and 8, um, Monday to Thursday this week. So uh, looking forward to seeing lots of you there. Thank you, Rebecca. We'll see you yeah. again tomorrow. Very welcome. Yep. See you all tomorrow. Bye.